So you can be seated. And as we said, and as I said earlier, we're entering into what the world calls the Easter season. It's not necessarily a bad thing to call it the Easter season, but it's just generally known across the world as the Easter season, Easter time. And from that, we know that there's been a lot of various things about the Easter season that mankind has brought into this as far as the celebration and different ways of, of doing things and even admitting that really the Easter across the board has really lost its flavor of what it really what it really is. And we know that. But we're going to learn what the Bible says about this Easter season. The week before Easter then, which is on a Sunday, or known also as Resurrection Sunday, is known as the Passion Week. This week before Easter is known as the Passion Week, and the Passion Week is, the, is Christ's last week in his ministry on earth. And it says in Luke 9, 51, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. He was passionate about going to Jerusalem because he knew everything that was supposed to happen and he was passionate and determined. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. So this is where we get the term, the Passion Week. It was Jesus' passion to go to Jerusalem this week. And we saw at the beginning of the week, as you've heard, and maybe from past uh, experiences at churches that you've been, been to, there's, a, there's a, a, a Sunday called Palm Sunday. And that would normally be attributed to what we're, uh, what we're celebrating today. Palm Sunday is the week before uh, the, the Easter celebration or the resurrection celebration. And the reason that God's name Palm Sunday is because of, uh, we know, as, as palm leaves put down as welcoming royalty. And that's where it got its name. So many consider this, many consider this uh, time in this Passion Week as 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 just is is just a regular week, but there's a lot of events that happen during this week that we need to uh, recognize and appreciate. And so, what we see here then is that Jesus was on his way to his final week of life, and this had been planned in eternity past. This whole week was passed or uh, planned before the foundation of the world. And along the way, there was various things that led up to this. He had saved Zacchaeus this hated tax collector along the way towards Jerusalem. And this is in Luke 19, 2 through 9. He had raised Lazarus from the dead, which sparked the religious leaders to then conspire to kill Jesus and even conspire to kill Lazarus because they had to get rid of the evidence because they admitted and they knew that Jesus raised this man from the dead. So they had to kill Jesus and they planned to kill Jesus and also, Lazarus to get rid of the evidence. We see this in John eleven fifty three and John twelve ten, and his entry into Jerusalem on this particular day was exactly as predicted by Daniel, the book of Daniel, exactly four hundred and eighty three years after what would be called the edict of the Persian king Artaxerxes. Okay, so what happened was, is that back in the book of Nehemiah and Daniel, it talks about this Persian king who was over all of the world at the time, allowed the Jews to return and go back and return the, the uh, re rebuild the temple. And Daniel had prophesied that once this edict would happen, exactly 483 years to the day that this Messiah King would come into Jerusalem. And so this very day this occurred, this prophecy was to be the very day of, of Monday, not Sunday, but so basically it's, it would be called really Palm Monday, but for the tradition of, of us meeting on Sundays, we would call it Palm Sunday. But it was exactly on the Jewish calendar of the month of Nisan, it's called, Nisan 10, is when he came into Jerusalem, and it was AD 30. In other words, 30 AD. And the crucifixion of Christ occurred four days later on Friday, Nisan 14. It was exactly as predicted. It was planned by God 
before Jesus was born, before we were born, before the world was even created. And Jesus, as the faithful king, initiated and orchestrated his own kingly coronation on that particular day. Jesus initiated and orchestrated his kingly coronation on this day, pre-planning about the donkey cult and prophesying then that it would be there and telling them that it would be there and telling them that the guy would uh, say, hey, or somebody would say, hey, what are you doing with the donkey? And that they would say, they would get basically, which is the, which is the, the magic word of, hey, uh, what are you doing with this donkey? Oh, I'm here taking it for the Lord. Okay, you can take it then. Jesus had planned this out. And they used, uh, he, he brought this donkey uh, colt. Jesus got on this donkey colt. You guys remember what it said earlier? It had never been written. It, the, the donkey colt had never been ridden. So think about that for a minute. Jesus, the creator of all things, was able to ride this donkey colt that had never been ridden. And the people then laid down palm leaves as would be uh, for a king's reception. It was a royal reception. It was a tradition of laying down palm trees or palm leaves for a, a king that was coming into town. So Jesus not only prophesied himself as finding and writing the cults, but he also fulfilled prophecy from Zechariah 9.9 that was written hundreds of years before this happened regarding a donkey cult that Israel's king would be humble and brought salvation to Jerusalem and he would come into Jerusalem riding a donkey colt. Jesus fulfilled his own prophecy of saying, hey, there's going to be a donkey colt when you go over there, and the prophecy of Zechariah from hundreds of years before. And so with this then, there is no mistake that Jesus was presenting himself as a king on this day. There was no mistake that he was allowing himself to be honored as a king on this day. And in the past, as you know, Jesus has always downplayed who he really was because he it had to be at a certain time. He had always downplayed. He laid low and downplayed his kingship. Matthew 16, 16 and John 6 tells us about that. But on this particular day, he made a decisive confrontation with the religious leaders by showing himself as a king. He pushed their last button by waltzing into town with everybody following him, claiming he was the king. And so he did this on purpose. And this was all part of God's eternal and sovereign plan, according to this predetermined timeline. And earlier, as you know this, the religious leaders had tried to stone him at one point, but they couldn't. And we know earlier that the people were angry with Jesus and tried to throw him off the cliff, but they couldn't. Both wanted him dead, but it wasn't yet time. This time, the leaders said, we got to kill this guy but after the Passover, so we don't have any witnesses. It's still, this was Jesus' time. And as they said, hey, we need to lay low. We don't want to do this now in front of everybody. Jesus pushed their buttons and caused them to do it exactly when God had planned for them to put him to death. So according to God's plan, Jesus was to be the Passover lamb only four days later, according to God's plan. And according to his timing, Jesus Christ then claimed and proved that he was the long-awaited faithful king of the Jews, the Messiah. And as he approached the end of this week, the Passion Week, he continued offering forgiveness to anyone who repented and believed, and he even did this on the cross. He continued to offer this as they were planning to kill him. And he proved that he could forgive them because he proved that he was God by raising Lazarus from the dead. So he offered forgiveness. He proved that he could forgive. But the Jews weren't looking at this whole forgiveness thing. The Jews wanted spiritual power over religion. The Romans wanted political power over the world. And the people wanted personal power over the oppression that they were feeling. None of them wanted a king who would address sin, but yet sin was their greatest need because uh, their, their forgiveness was their greatest need because sin was their greatest problem. They needed to be forgiven for sin 
And their attitude is no, we don't care about that because we don't sin. We want religious power, we want political power, and we want personal power. And so all the people rebelled against Jesus. None of them wanted this king. He was finally arrested and then mistreated, to say the least, from those people that he came to save. <clears throat> yet, yet this was the Father's plan, and Jesus was 100% obedient to the Father's plan of this mistreatment, offering forgiveness at the same time. <clears throat> Christ ate the Passover lamb on Thursday night with his disciples, and he was the Passover lamb on Friday. <clears throat> He ate the Passover lamb, the Lord's Supper, communion, which we'll get to celebrate today. And he was the Passover lamb the next day on Friday, Nisan 14. Christ's kingship turned from the beginning of the week, which his majesty demonstrated, not just because he was on a pony or a, horse, a colt, not just because of the palm leaves, not because of the robes, but he has already proven himself as the king. He'd raised people from the dead. He'd forgiven them. He'd healed them. He'd already, he waltzes, he comes into town, waltzing into town with, with his people, and he's proclaiming it as king, but it, ha it changed real quick at the end of the week. His majesty went from majesty to mockery by the end of the week. They took everything from his majesty, the king of kings. They took everything from him. They took his freedom, they took his rights, his ministry, his clothing, and finally his life. And instead, they gave him a mockery of his kingship. He had everything, they took everything away, and instead they gave him a mockery of his kingship. They gave him a crown of thorns, which tore his face up and his head up. They gave him, as we will see in a minute, Two right-hand men for the king's court. They were criminals that, he put on, that they put on the cross on each side of him. And what's interesting is James and John had asked Jesus and had their mommy ask Jesus, hey, can my, my boys James and John um, sit at each side of you in your glory at a place of royalty? And instead they gave Jesus two criminals to be on each side, his right-hand man and his left-hand man. Criminals is what they gave him. They gave him a cup of cheap wine to prolong his pain. In other words, the cheap wine would then actually cause his pain to be numbed a little bit so he could hang there longer and be miserable longer. It was basically a sarcastic offering of this cheap wine. And then they offered him then a soldier's scratchy wool robe. Okay, well that's interesting. What do I, why do I mean this by scratchy? Because they had just torn up his back by whipping him. So his back's got flesh hanging off of it and blood, and then they give him a, a wool, scratchy robe to put across his back as a mockery of a king's robe. And then they gave him a reed imitating a royal scepter, and they used this reed then to beat him with it. And they spit in his face instead of kissing his face. Psalm 2 talks about us giving homage to the sun or kissing the sun. And instead of kissing the king's face, they spit in his face. And then they give him a sarcastic sign saying, this is the king of the Jews. His majesty went to mockery at the end of the week and he knew it was all going to happen and he sucked it up anyway. Then there's this whole thing called the crucifixion that he went through. Oh, you mean there's more than the beatings and all that? Yeah, oh yeah, there's this thing called the crucifixion that he went through. This crucifixion was even prophesied, listen to this, this whole thing of crucifixion hadn't even been invented, but it was prophesied centuries before it was even invented that this Messiah would be pierced. And we see that in, uh, in Psalm 22, and Isaiah 53, 5, and Zechariah 12, 10. Hundreds of years before a crucifixion was even invented, it was prophesied that the Messiah would go through this. And so this day that we talk about, this crucifixion is called Good Friday. Good, this whole day is called Good Friday. And the question is, is, as I had when I was a kid, why is it called Good Friday? It doesn't seem very good, does it? 
Today we're going to see this in Luke chapter 23. We're going to see this in Luke chapter 23, 32 through 43. It says this. This is what we're going to learn here. Is that this passage shows three truths that demonstrate the good of Good Friday that should help you to really appreciate your salvation. Three truths that demonstrate the good of Good Friday that should help you to appreciate your salvation. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 23. We're going to start out in verse 32. Two others also who were criminals were being led away to put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place called the skull, they were cruci- they, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Forgive, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. He took his clothes. And the people stood by looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If this is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, offering him the sour wine, and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, there was also an inscription above him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hanged there, who were hanged there, was hurling abuses at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him and said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And this is what Jesus said to this guy. Verse 43, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. So as we see, as we go through all these things, Satan flips everything that's good and flips it upside down and makes evil seem good and good seem evil. And he does it to this day. And he did it that week. Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, came in his majesty and it was flipped upside down where it became a mockery. Christ was, listen to this, Christ was crucified. The crime against him was blasphemy about speaking things bad of God, including that he was God himself. His charge against him was blasphemy, yet the people that were there all blasphemed against him in their mockery. They're the ones that were guilty of blasphemy. Their mockery was sin at its highest, at its zenith. They saw his miracles. They were firsthand witnesses more than any of us sitting in this room. They saw and they knew all these things that he did, and they mocked him anyways. They're in big trouble. This, this blasphemy on them, bag, bagging on God and mocking God this way, was the death penalty in Leviticus uh, 24.16. Even without the charge that they had against them of murdering the Messiah, just bad-mouthing him and mocking him was worthy of the death penalty for them. But now Jesus instead is on the cross as a blasphemer. And yet... The ones even now, the ones that that would repent could be saved. Isaiah talks about through chapter 40, 41, 42, 43, 52, and 55, that even those that would repent, because Jesus, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He still offered forgiveness. So let's look at these things. There's three truths that demonstrate the good of Good Friday that should help you appreciate your salvation. First, let's look at the convicts, plural, the convicts. We see this in in verse 32, 39, and then we also see it in Matthew 27 and Mark 15, and we're going to look into those a little bit too. But Luke 23, 32 says this, two others, two, that's plural, who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. And so Luke used the term 
for criminals, or the Greek term, uh, it, which then translates into the English term of, of criminals, and this particular Greek term that he uses means that they are evildoers, guilty of gross misdeeds, serious crimes as of pirates, is what the Greek definition of this term was. And the same term is used by Paul in 2 Timothy 2.9 to describe somebody that needs to be bound in chains because they're, they're that dangerous. That's who these criminals were. And we see in the parallel passages, meaning other passages in the Bible that describe the same event from a different angle, and that's what the Gospels give us. We see that in Matthew and Mark use a Greek term that means robbers. So they use a little bit different term uh, that means robbers, and it says here in Matthew 27, 38, at that time two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And the word robbers also can mean uh, insurrectionists, as Barabbas was, and we learned about him earlier uh, in the reading that he was a criminal who was actually uh, wanted for murder, and they released Barabbas so that they could crucify Jesus. And so we see that they were part of, uh, labeled as part of what he was guilty of. And with this, as we hear about the two thieves on the cross, uh, theft itself is not a capital offense that deserves the cross. So, so they weren't just, just regular thieves because theft is a crime against property. It was then, it still is. It means you're taking something. But robbery, as it was then and as it is now, is that you're taking it personally from somebody by force or fear and this, this force often led to assault with a deadly weapon and even murder. And that's what these guys were known as robbers. And so robbers was a crime against person and it could easily escalate. And therefore, even as Jesus talked about in Luke, uh, the chapter before here, Luke 22, 52, that robbers basically required clubs and swords to safely arrest. So basically, these criminals or robbers were convicted as violent and dangerous to society. Therefore, they deserve the death penalty. Therefore, these were really bad guys. Let's just get this straight. It wasn't just two thieves on the cross. These were really bad guys. Rome is not going to just execute anybody for nothing, as we know. It had to go through trials. And Rome elected to put these guys to death because they were that bad of guys. And we see here that both of these guys, in, we'll read this in Matthew 27, this is our parallel passage, Matthew 27, 38 to 44. We're going to see this, that both of these guys were mocking Jesus. Matthew 27, 38. At that time, two robbers were crucified with them, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, who are you, are you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priests also... We go all the way down. He trusts in God. Let him rescue him. And the robbers who had been crucified with him, they were also insulting with him the same words. So both of the robbers were insulting and assaulting Jesus with the same words along with the crowd. And these guys were convicts. These guys were convicts. And all of a sudden, Luke then reports what we read as an amazing change in the scenario. All of a sudden we got this amazing, miraculous change in the scenario. This is verse 39 in Luke 23, 39, in which we read a few minutes ago. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other, and remember, there's a but, a conjunction here. But the other criminal answered and rebuking that criminal, and he said this, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So what we're going to see is this man went from being a convict to a convert immediately. There was two convicts and immediately one convert. He was suddenly taking Jesus' side against everyone. All of a sudden, 
He's sticking up for Jesus against everybody, including all of those that can inflict even more pain on him. All of those, he was, he, he, he was completely hanging in there. He was helpless, and he was at the mercy of these guys, and all of a sudden he didn't care about these guys. Miraculously, he wasn't concerned about his physical pain, and miraculously, miraculously, he's now all of a sudden out of nowhere concerned with this spiritual condition, including these guys that had total control over his pain and punishment, and it must have shocked his partner in crime. Like, where did this come from? How, how is this all happening? And this man now was now offended by the mockery against Christ. He was now offended by this mockery. He was just doing it himself minutes before, maybe seconds before. And all of a sudden, he's offended by this. All of a sudden, he feared God and loved Jesus. Just like that. He was part of the world, then suddenly couldn't understand the world. He, he, he all of a sudden was what were described in John 15, 19. He was a pilgrim in this world. And he, all of a sudden, he was not of this world. And all of a sudden, his thinking was completely different, just like that. He saw that his physical punishment was nothing compared to hell, all of a sudden. All of a sudden, the ouch of the spike and the hanging there and the shredded back that he must have had too, and the fact that his... his feet were punctured and then he had to use his legs to push against his feet, hurting his feet even more to raise up, to take a breath. And, and he's using his breath to speak out on Jesus' behalf out of nowhere. He understood this. Now all of a sudden, he was no longer afraid of those who could kill the body, but instead feared the one that could send him to hell, which Jesus talked about in Luke 12, 4 and 5. From no fear of God, like those described in Romans 3.18, they don't care and they have no fear of God. All of a sudden, this guy had a fear of God because of his sin, just like Luke 18.13 talks about. We see this then, that he has this total fear of God because of his sin all of a sudden. And then we see his confession of himself. He says this, and indeed, we are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve. In, in verse 41, he's overwhelmed by his own guilt and all of a sudden sensitive to sin. All of a sudden. Have I said that enough times? <laughs> all of a sudden. Matthew 5, all of a sudden, he's one of those guys that's all of a sudden poor in spirit, mourning over his sin. He came to his senses suddenly, just like the prodigal son did in Luke 15, 17 to 18. In Matthew 3, again, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. He was seen as all of a sudden, seen as part of the Father's plan of His predestination that we read about in Ephesians 1. That all of a sudden, He was part of the plan. He was part of the plan, and He was predestined. And listen to this. Not only was He predestined in the book of life, but He was also prophesied about in Isaiah about 600 years before this happened. He was prophesied that Jesus would be numbered with transgressors. In other words, that there would be criminals with Jesus that he would be with upon his murder. And so this guy's story was written way before even the foundation of the earth and then even prophesied about. He had been written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, we learn in Revelation 13, 8. This guy was all of a sudden recognizing and seeing, not understanding theology, but understanding that he was part of this. And, and he was written, and all this was so that this very day, that this very day, he would glorify Christ. The whole story of his life, the whole reason he was there is for this day to glorify Christ and for this day today that we're reading about it. His whole life, everything he went through was for that day, and this day for us to read that God had planned. This is all part of the Father's plan. And he was born again that very moment by the performance of the Holy Spirit that we also learned about in Ephesians chapter 1. He was born again. Listen to this. Nicodemus says this. Uh, I mean, sorry. Jesus said this to Nicodemus, the Pharisee who showed up to ask Jesus, hey, 
we know that you're smart. We know you're from God. Um, I really don't want any of my friends to see me, but you know, give me some inside scoop here. That's basically what happened that night. But this is what Jesus said to Nicodemus, which Nicodemus was baffled by at the time, but then eventually saw the big picture. This is what Jesus said. Truly, truly, I say to you, this is what he's saying to the Pharisee, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This guy suddenly saw the kingdom of God. Just like that. He was born again. Even through his overwhelming physical pain and desire for relief, spiritual relief is what was more important to him all of a sudden. He was immediately sound-minded. He suddenly loved the Lord and hated the mockery against him. And we could see in his rebuke of even the other criminal of telling him, shut up with that stuff. He was disgusted by what was coming out of that guy's mouth and what everybody else's mouth. The same way as we as Christians hate hearing these mockery of Christ. And we even hate false Christs that are presented to us because we love Christ. He confessed his sin. He admitted he deserved death. He knew he was on his way to hell. He knew he was worthy of going to hell. He understood and confessed his condition. He understood and confessed who he was. Then we get to this, his belief in Jesus. The convert's belief in Jesus, verse, the other half of verse 41. But this man, is what he says about Jesus, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember, all of a sudden, he saw the kingdom of God. This man not only understood and admitted the truth about himself, he believed the truth about Jesus. He believed that Jesus was a sinless man, just like Colossians 2.9 says. Just as King Herod, Pilate, and the Roman soldier did, all in Luke 23, he recognized that Jesus was sinless. He understood in his, by what he's saying, is that he understood that Jesus was the Savior. He understood this about Jesus. This is the one I need to beg to. This is the Savior. He is in control. He also showed that he understood that Jesus would be resurrected. Because he knew they were all going to die. But he knew that there would be the kingdom of God after the resurrection. He knew Jesus was the Messiah who had a kingdom. He knew the cross. Listen to this part. He knew even better than the rest of his disciples knew that this cross was not the end of the Messiah, but the beginning of the Messiah's kingdom. He knew even more than his disciples understood that scattered during this time. And this, therefore, he understood the resurrection and what we see in Romans 10, 9. If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, along with acknowledging him as Lord. He knew Jesus had power behind, beyond death, and he knew that Jesus had the power to forgive, and he knew that Jesus was the judge, he knew that Jesus was the king, and he knew that Jesus was God himself. So what does he do? He knows about himself, and he knows the truth of God, and the truth of Christ, and he admits it about himself, and he admits it about Christ, and now what does he do? Verse 43, he cries out for mercy. And with this belief in Jesus, he cries out for mercy. Remember me is the cry. Remember me. And what this, what this means by remember is, and we see it all throughout the Bible, including uh, in, in Psalm 8, 4. But remember means to have concern for me. And even King David wrote in Psalm 8, verse 4, he said, it's amazing, God, that you actually have concern for mankind. And this man is begging for Jesus to be concerned about him. We see the same word used in Hebrew 2, uh, 2 6 and Luke 1 72. He says, then he begged Jesus to have, he said, basically, have concern for me in your kingdom. Don't forget about me. Have concern for me in your kingdom. So, this is what we have here in the conclusion of what we saw with him, anyway. He had a sudden fear of the Lord, which surpassed every other fear and pain. He had a sudden awareness of his own, his own sin that prompted his confession. He had a sudden understanding, belief, 
and love for Christ, he, and this all led out to his sudden cry for mercy, making a complete fool out of himself, not to mention, in front of everybody else, not to mention aligning himself with this other criminal that could have brought on even more abuse, this other criminal, so-called criminal Jesus. And all of this can only be explained by the Father's plan from eternity past on this whole plan, the Spirit's performance in his life, being born again in his heart in those last few minutes, and which regenerated him. And then it caused him then to recognize the Son's provision, as we learn also in Ephesians 1, that he recognized this is who I need to be attached to. He is the one to provide me with my salvation. God changed this man immediately in the presence of everybody there. He went from convict to convert in front of everyone. So how do we know this? Is it because I looked at this and we can assume this because of these things that are said? Well, we can assume these things. That's correct. And we could stop there and, and walk away and say, it's obvious that this guy was saved. We could say that. <laughs> but what we have here is we have the confirmation of Christ. Even better than what we think, because the truth is, is I'm already convinced before I get to this verse 43. But this is what verse 43 says. Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, you shall be with me in today. You shall be with me in paradise. Truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Jesus confirmed this conversion as being complete. Jesus confirmed that this man had saving faith, that we can see that this man and what he said, demonstrating what was in his heart, which means demonstrating his condition, we can say that's what saving faith looks like because that's what Jesus is confirming. And Jesus started out with this. He said, truly, and we know that he says that a lot. And what does truly mean? It means pay attention to what I'm about to say. Wake up. You need to hear this. And we know this. We know that it wasn't the thief that wrote the words of Jesus down because he was dead after this. The, the, the robber, I'm sorry. It, it was said loud enough by Jesus for the witnesses to hear, including the ones that wrote, uh, that were passing on the information with, with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All of them being accessible to Jesus saying this. It wasn't just this thief, this thief, a uh, robber, criminal guy claiming that Jesus said this. They all said that Jesus said this. And Jesus says today, and what this means is, it meant the next 24 hours or at least even by sunset that he would be in, par in paradise with him. That day, just like mankind was created on the sixth day of the creation week, today means today. And what we see here then at the Greek emphasis that Jesus said, the emphasis is basically what Jesus was saying to him, with me, you shall be in paradise. The emphasis is the with me part, which is the most important part. Jesus is saying, truly, truly, I say to you today, with me, you will be in paradise. And paradise is heaven. It was first used to describe the Garden of Eden in the Old Testament, this word. Then in the New Testament, it was shown to be actually heaven itself. And we see this in Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 4. Paul says that he was caught up in the paradise, which was heaven. And we see at the end of the, the Bible in Revelation 2, 7, 22, 2, and 14, uh, 19, we see that the tree of life is located in paradise, which is heaven. In other words, the criminal's body would be in the grave or still on the cross when he died. Yet his spirit would be present with the Lord that day. That's the situation is that his spirit would be present with God, with Jesus in heaven on that very day. And we see this how it works in 2 Corinthians 5, 8. His body then would be awaiting the resurrection. We, we know about at the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. But what this does is it shoots down false doctrine of, of this opportunity where there's this thing called soul sleep or there's this other thing that other people talk about, this thing called purgatory, where there's this whole time frame of 
of, well, after you die, then there's just going to be this, you know, maybe you have a chance to burn this off, or maybe you have a chance to be saved, or maybe you have, no, it's the second you, you die, you are already either saved or not saved. And so this, once again, squelches any of that, any of those false teachings. Christ said that this criminal would be with him in heaven today. And so these are the three truths that we saw that should demonstrate and show us the good of Good Friday. We saw that there were convicts, really bad guys, two of them. And we see that there's a convert all of a sudden. And then we see the confirmation of Christ. We saw a little while later, the Christ proclaimed it is finished, announcing the completion of his work on the cross for those who would believe. In other words, there's an end of the story. Christ pulled it off. He said it was finished. He paid the price. And then what did he do? He submitted himself, his spirit to the Father, and said, it's time now. I submit my spirit to you. And at that point, he died. According to who? According to him. According to his plan. He said, it is finished, which means the sacrifice is complete, which means we don't put Jesus back on the cross every Sunday or every Monday or every week at Mass. It's complete. The sacrifice is done. Everyone that's in Christ, the second they die, they will be with him in paradise that day. And that's what we have. If Jesus, listen to this part, if Jesus would have come down from the cross, he would have saved himself, but not us. He could have gotten himself off the cross and saved himself, but he didn't. He stayed on until it was finished so that he could save us. Jesus practiced what he preached by denying himself and taking up his cross that he told us to do in Luke 9.23. He said that his followers would deny themselves and take up their cross daily. He demonstrated that. He did it. He demonstrated that he could forgive sin, and then, therefore, by him forgiving sin in this manner, that we then should have the same attitude of forgiveness. If we have an opportunity to forgive somebody that repents, we need to do the same thing. And he taught that in Luke 5.24, 6.37, and 11.4. With no limit to the forgiveness, as Jesus demonstrated. With no limit to the forgiveness. He did it, and we have to be available to forgive our enemies in the same way. Also, he taught us and demonstrated that we're to love our enemies. And we can say when he first said it back then, wow, that's easy for you to say. <laughs> and we see it's not easy for him to say he forgave his enemies. We see this. He came to forgive sin. And this is also then an example of what Jesus talked about, that the first uh, will be last and the last will be first. Jesus has talked about that that the first will be last and the last will be first because this guy here, this criminal was the last one that anyone would expect to be saved. Yet, listen to this part, he is the first one among all of the mockers to repent and to turn to Christ, and everybody saw it. All the religious leaders, all the upstanding Roman soldiers that might have been you know, just hardworking guys, and all the so-called innocent people were all mocking him, and the criminal... The last guy that anybody would expect, he gets saved and Jesus reports it to all of us saying there's a hope for everybody. There's hope for everybody. And the other ones that were invited first, especially the religious leaders that were invited first into the kingdom. We, we see that as we go through the whole Bible that in the book of Revelation, that they will finally recognize the one they pierced and they will be the last ones that actually, as, as a nation, come to Christ, even though they're the first ones that had the opportunity. Here we go. So this con convert then demonstrated true conversion, and it was confirmed by Christ. Now listen to this part. He had been, this is another thing that attacks false doctrine, so it's, it's really important, but these passages are amazing because they knock down stuff you might hear somewhere that's lies. Jesus, in this case, then, he had been, I mean, this, this criminal had been baptized by the Holy Spirit that day. In other words, 
Being baptized by the Holy Spirit means that that is when the Holy Spirit gets into your heart and changes you, and you then become a Christian because now you go through the same change that this guy did, and you are a changed person. This is known then as the first baptism. That actually the Holy Spirit comes into you and changes your heart. And we see this in, in Mark 1 8, Acts 1 5, Acts 2 38, 10 47, and 11 16. Then listen to this part. He actually participated in what the meaning of the second baptism is. Okay, let's chew on that for a minute. He participated in what the second, the meaning of the second baptism is. Is the second baptism is what we do publicly by getting dunked in the water to publicly confess and proclaim that the first baptism had occurred. In other words, when you invite everybody over saying, you need to come because I'm getting baptized today, you need to, I need to, I want to testify to you what happened to me. Okay? The, the criminal on the cross testified to everybody, including us, what happened to his heart. That's basically what a baptism is, as far as the gist of it. He publicly, publicly confessed his testimony and confessed Christ before men. Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. But if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. And that's what he did. The only thing is that was missing was the water. Now, what this shows, once again, beautiful when we dig into the scripture. Water baptism is not, you got to get this part. Water baptism is not required to be saved. Because this man was saved and he had not been baptized under water. <clears throat> However, what this does is it's an obedient act of proclaiming Christ before men. And so with this, water is not the requirement, but the public confession is actually the requirement. And what's happened was it is, is that some people say, just get them in the water and they'll be they'll be saved. And it's like, no, 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 no. The, the heart change has to happen first, and then the proclamation that the heart change occurred happens, and it is, it is sig symbolized by d being dunked under the water, which is something that we should do to be obedient because Christ did the same thing. But they get it backwards. They say, oh, you got to be dunked in the water, and you got to baptize your babies, and all these things. It's not the water. It's the public proclamation. The water demonstrates what happened as a symbol. So th this is why we do baptisms in the water, but don't get it backwards. And this is what we see. What we're getting at is this incident proves that you don't have to have been dunked in the water to be saved. So we want to clarify that. Jesus says this, as we talked about, therefore, anyone, everyone who confesses me before man, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. This is in um, Matthew 10.32. So this, this ex-convict now, he's an ex-convict, demonstrated the critical components of true faith. Christ confirmed him as a true Christian, and these components, what he did and what you need to know and what you need to be able to explain to your friends is these com critical components of being saved are this. Admitting and confessing the truth about yourself with having a fear of God and then the confession of sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You have to admit and confess who you are. The second part is admitting and confessing the truth about Jesus. You got to get both of these. The sinless man, the Jesus is the sinless man and God himself. And for him, in him, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily force, in bodily form, Colossians 2.9. And that he died as a substitute for your sin. You have to understand that, that you had to be perfect to be saved and you couldn't be. And he was the substitute. You have to admit and confess that you understand that. And that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and that he was raised from the dead. Romans 10.9 talks about this. Then, 
By asking for mercy, recognizing that you are powerless before God and going to him on your own and, and, and confessing these things to him. And as we can see, you don't have to have a particular prayer. This guy didn't. But those components of you need to understand who you are and confess it. You need to understand who Jesus is and confess it. And you need to say, based on those things, Lord, I am nothing. I'm doomed. I'm on my way to hell. Please save me. That's how you become a Christian. It's that easy. Nobody gave the thief a theology class. And he might be, enjoy even hearing all this unpacked, uh, which he already knows right by now. But he didn't know all these things at the time. <clears throat> but that demonstrated true salvation. So we see these three truths that demonstrate why we call this Good Friday. If you don't have the assurance of salvation, today is the day of salvation while he is near, meaning he's in your ears, the word has been in your ears, hopefully in your heart. Admit and confess the truth about yourself. Admit and confess the truth about Christ. <clears throat> and cry out for mercy and receive the free gift of salvation 